You don't want it in the clips. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of clips, we had uh, <laughs> we had, we had a, everyone freak out about one of my clips last last episode, which is that. hilarious. Um, I was talking about the, the stick trick stuff, how it's not hockey. Yeah. Um, most of the people agreed, but there was a good portion. I found more people on TikTok actually were upset about it than really than Instagram. Yeah, which makes sense, younger audience. So they're all like jumping to the to the defense of these really? trickster guys. So I forgot. I didn't know the guys' names when we were talking about it. But one of them was Zach Bell. Now yeah. I know the name because I've been reminded one <laughs> million times. Yeah, I don't know who that is. Yeah, he he's got like over a million followers on I know TikTok because I checked after. Yeah. Um, and he's one of those trick guys, and it's cool. He gets. Uh, I I watched one of his videos. He had got some kind of brand deal or sponsorship with a car company. I forget what car company it was. Okay. And he did a video stick handling through their car showroom. As like a oh, yeah. as like a commercial kind of thing. Yeah. So that was cool. And then there was another guy, Swaggy P, who I didn't know. I actually didn't know who that was at the time. I think I'd seen clips of him before, but I didn't know his name. Um, and he ended up commenting on the video, which was funny. Uh, kind of saying like what we were what we were saying is dumb. And then we had a little back and forth, and we ended up kind of agreeing. And then he ended up deleting the comment after, which I don't know why. Or it's maybe I can't find it, so I think he deleted it. But, um. Obviously, the point, I think everyone understands the point that I was saying, which was if you... Yeah, what's the point? If you... Like, I, I know the point, but yeah, like if you for do, people that aren't sure. If you are focusing a lot of your time on doing this trick stuff, that's fine. You can practice however you want. But if you're doing it because you think this is a useful metric, like if I can do this trick shot, that means I'm better at hockey, then that's not correct. That has nothing to do with whether or not it makes you practice or motivated to practice. I was talking to you t- this morning about when I was a kid, there was the Crosby move. That was the big move. Like right now, it's, I would say it's probably the Michigan. When I was a kid, it was, called, it was the Crosby move where you'd come in on a breakaway and you could pick the puck up flat on the blade and did like a little 360, flinging it in the air off the stick. And you could do it. And you could kind of pull it off in a game, maybe. Um, <clears throat> I don't recall seeing anyone do it in a game. Maybe they did, but... Penalty shots, maybe. Yeah, I remember, I remember this happening because I wanted to be able to do this move, and I thought only good players could do this move. That's what I actually thought, and I wasn't necessarily saying if I can do this, I'll be a way better hockey player. But I was thinking only good players can do this move, and that's that's just not true. It doesn't matter, you know. So that was my point: is just if you guys practice tricks a lot because you want to and it's fun, that's fine. Like I don't care, but if you're doing it because you think this is going to contribute to your success in the game, it's not really. And the the one that example everyone likes to give is like, oh, see you guys doing the Michigan in the game now and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, but you can actually do that in a game situation. And it's only one example of a move. The other one was, remember when, uh, was it, was his last name Malik that did the through the legs yep. on a, on a, yep. and then Merrick guys, Malik. yeah, Merrick Malik. And then guys started doing it in the game. It's like, yeah, you can do that in a game, but you, it's the excessive, stuff and even those moves are exceptions like those are not happening very often in the game right no no so um yeah i'm gonna touch on that though okay because uh i remember being a kid and wayne gretzky did a commercial for seven up i think it was had his titan stick did a pull in right pull in flipped it up one two three baseball batted and everybody we did it all the time that was like the trick move back in the day can you imagine that Pull it, like if you can't do that now, pull it in. So one, one, two, three, and hit it. And who may, who knows if it took him eight takes to do or whatever, but it was not a big deal, but he did. And that was like the big move back then. And um, um, of course you're going to try it, right? But I, I, do have a th- I do have a thing on that though. Is, uh, this is, it's very true. That stuff does not make you a better hockey player. Like, I, I mean, I'd rather have someone work on, you know, just shooting properly and, like whatever, all the different skills and learning the positions and all that better. The flip side of that is I, I do like, uh, I do like some of that. I, I don't know. I would never oppose to doing it, but not focus on it because doing it gives your body like, you know, a little bit of proprioception, trying different things. And like, you never know, right. When you're in a position where in a game, like, okay, so just take that toe drag, toe, that toe drag like Gretzky did back in 1979 and tapping it three times, like you'd say, we never use that game. No, actually, you would. You, you, so you're coming in on a on a stick, or someone maybe slides to stop a shot, or you're pulling out of a pile. There's your pull in, flipping it over a body and shooting. 
like there's there there are things but to that point if you spend if you're on the ice for two hours and you're working on that trick play all the time you're there's better use to your time and there's it's a time and a place for that stuff so that's what and i've always always said that to players i said sometimes you're going to work on a skill a stick handling skill let's say or a shooting not so much a shooting skill but a stick handling skill that you don't use a whole lot but you work you might practice it for four hours like over the course of time to use it for a split second but being able to do something for that split second it was a split second is a huge thing so that's like the the skill buckets, right? You 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 want to fill every skill bucket. You want to be able to do everything. You do actually, like you do want to be able to like if you see what's his name, Swaggy P. So if you see Swaggy P do something and if you can do it, it's probably better than not being able to do it because he's agile and he's you know he's got sick hands and stuff. But having said all that, you want to play the game the right way, and then if anything like that comes to you in a game then you have that in your bucket so yeah. like, and i know you agree with that yeah because even yeah. even all that stuff like i would go as far as the michigan move let's say where there's i can see that in a game tapping the puck in the air i can see that in a game my what i was talking about was the like twirl the stick around your arm kick it off your boot yeah, off yeah, your yeah. head yeah 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 360 spin shot like i was doing the exaggerated examples that's what i was talking about things where you can actually see a place for it in the game. Like there's no pro like there's no issue. Even the flippy stuff. I don't care because a lot of the pushback I was getting was like, it gets kids to practice. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's it wants, and that's all fine. Yeah, that was yeah. just not my point, but yeah. not the point of what yeah, I was the talking point, about. The point at all. is because everybody that I, sorry, I get on the microphone here. Everybody in the eighties for three years did the Gretzky thing. And there wasn't an extra NHL hockey player. Well, and so, so, so in the, that's the, another thing too, is a lot of, a lot of people are saying how the game evolves and that stuff comes into it more and whatever. And it's like to a degree, because even that, that tap play that Gretzky was doing, you see that not often <laughs> still, it's not like all of a sudden everyone's only tapping it around and not handling it on the ice anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, and I'm going to say this, and I know a lot of people say, no, it's different. The game's changed a lot, but it hasn't changed that much. I'll tell you one thing that changes the game is the guy that has a little bit of uh, grit to him. You know, when, every time I watch a live game and I see someone get in people's faces and have a little bit more hardcore stuff, it's guys back off. And and that is, if I was just told 90% of the players right now, not even though they might not be like gritty guys, but if I was to say, if you're going to work on one thing, I'd work on battles and I'd work on um, learning how to be tough. Like I'm not talking, well, whatever, tough. Getting in people's faces and being a hard uh, guy to play against instead of soft. So I'd work on the hard stuff rather than the soft stuff. Like this, the hands and all that stuff is fine, but everyone's doing that. And now you stick out, like that used to be the guy that used to stick out like a sore thumb when Denny Savard came in the NHL. Coming up the ice, spinorama, making plays having the puck on a stick and all that stuff, right? That was like, wow, everybody else used to be tough. Now, everybody works on doing all the silky stuff, and that's good. It adds the skill of the game until Arbor comes along and straightens you out every, every shift, and you don't want to go in that corner. And that's, that's – I lean that way. And you can – whoever listens, you don't like that. It's fine. I'm just – I'm right. Yeah. I am. I know. I, I remember, remember watching, playoff hockey. That's what it is. A hundred percent for sure. I remember watching uh, the old, I don't know if it was the Don Cherry VHS clips. They'd have <laughs> Danny Savard highlights. Yeah. Old school hockey videos. So cool. So cool. Um, but, but that's, but that's where I would work on. And I, I, I know that like scouts are drooling for guys that yeah. will play with some grit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then that's, I, I wanted to talk about it more so to just like, obviously it's a, issue that people fall on both sides on so i think it's nice to talk about it for a little extra time um so we're gonna go to the next one today about uh the neutral zone so last time last time we did uh d zone we went over all like the quadrant things some different situations so if you haven't watched that one that's a good kind of primer to how this uh episode is going to go but you can watch it in isolation too that's fine um so we're gonna go through offensive and defensive side of uh playing in the neutral zone which i think is important because I'm noticing with with the team that I now coach, they uh, it's an easy place to get lost. It's an easy place to uh, think doesn't matter or think like that you can take your you know shut your brain off for a bit. Um, but a lot of things happen uh, in the neutral zone. So, uh, so I guess kind of to start off, 
last time we did, we talked about D zone and you kind of laid out kind of a, a little bit of a philosophy about defensive zone play, or whatever. So I don't know if you have something like that you want to start with, or do you want to go right to the well, board stuff? No, for sure. I, the, like the neutral zones, it's, it's interesting because I never gave it two thoughts in my life until I got to uh, junior hockey. And still, it wasn't really it, like in my days, the eighties, it wasn't, uh, wasn't really preached. It was like, I mean, your blue lines, don't turn it over at the blue line. Don't turn it over at your, at their blue line, right? Get it in, get it out. That's, that was the philosophy. And it was like, okay. And then we, when I played, there was a red line. So we didn't have the stretch passes that you were allowed to do. We called a two line pass. So the neutral zone was maybe not as important, but it was important because the emphasis was on uh, getting it in, getting it out. That's, you know, cause that's basically where the neutral zone is. Other than that, what are you thinking about in the neutral zone? You're thinking of your, maybe your back checks or carrying the puck with some speed. And it wasn't really, um, wasn't really emphasized so much, but, um, and I think when people grow grow through the game of hockey, especially at younger ages, like you wouldn't even know, you wouldn't th- you wouldn't think it's a zone, right? You know, like as far as a player goes, they're not thinking neutral zone. And I think a lot of coaches would fall into that category too. In um, especially, I'm not talking pros, I'm talking in youth hockey, that your neutral zone is uh, you know probably doesn't get as much thought as like a D zone coverage or a four check. The thing with the neutral zone is like all plays got to go through it. And it's actually the area of the game where if you're successful in the neutral zone, it could win you games. So offensively, how it wins you games is like you're picking up turnovers. You're, you're entering with speed. You're, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. You're making plays. Like it used to be when, like in the 80s, well, before the red line, you'd have to come out of your zone either skating it or passing it up. Now, because it's stretched out, there's no red line. You could put guys up at the far blue line. And now that's where I find the game is a little bit more boring. You can just fire it up, jackknife it in and forecheck if you happen to get there on time. So now, so that's, that's now, but you used to have to pass it through. Um, so the, on the defensive side, it's like you can literally frustrate the hell out of the other team in the neutral zone and you could win games on turnovers. And so for me, the neutral zone is uh, is is huge. It's huge. And like when I when I coached, um, well, we spent a lot of time talking about the neutral zone. We had a neutral zone structure uh, for Bantam kids. Now, as far as youth hockey goes, I think there's a time and a place to to teach a neutral zone because uh, and, and yes and no. I would keep it. I'm gonna leave you keep the simplest one. Um, today and it would be uh, basically defending the neutral zone, and that would be like a, a one two two. Yeah. So so we'll get, we'll get into that in a second. Just maybe to add on to what you're saying, you kind of said this without using these terms. Is obviously it's called the neutral zone, so it's neutral for both teams. But really, what's happening is that's where your brain transition kind of happens at the most basic level from offense to defense or from defense to offense. So once you're entering that, that's where you're brain should start to flip into offensive mindset versus flip back from offense into defensive mindset. So I think that's a good way of thinking about it for young players or young coaches or whatever, when you're discussing it, these are things that because we've been at higher levels now, we just take for granted that these are things are understood, but this is literally where your brain should, the switch should flip. If you're, if you're going to put one spot on it, obviously we can talk about if the D has it in your corner, full possession, a guy can run a stretch pass and now he's thinking offense and obviously there's exceptions, but generally speaking, that's kind of where that flip happens. And I think your point about like kind of the significance of where uh, this can win or lose you games. I think on the defensive side, especially just to reiterate what you were saying is this is where you can constantly get turnovers. You can constantly get the puck. You can constantly frustrate teams um, and you can really strategize to get different types of teams, depending on the style of play to play into your hand based on what you decide they are weak at or strong at or whatever. So this is where the strategy really starts to come into play because there's lots of moving parts. So if you can have a good strategy through that zone where everybody's going to be skating, that's where you can cause a lot of problems and and find some benefit for your team uh, based on your strengths and based on the weaknesses uh, of the other team. And that's kind of where the thinking part comes in. So this has been something that I've been talking with our, our guys about the last two weeks that I've had them now is and it sounds like obviously, but you have to be able to think 
situationally based on what's going on around you. And I was, we, we had a conversation Monday with one of the other coaches and he was talking about how <clears throat> a lot of times coaches don't let players think. They just say, you have to do this, you have to do this. And I think it's important that when we talk about all of these basic things, which you always do every time you're talking about it, is you say, this is just a frame. Like this is just something at a base level to lay a foundation that you work up from. And I think if you're a good coach, you should always be throwing an element of this is generally what the rule of thumb is, but you have to be able to play. You have to be able to see things. Um, I was talking to our guys about it in terms of play calls. So when we're calling certain face-off plays, it's like if this play only works if this draw is one clean to this defenseman, mm -hmm. right? If it's if you that can't doesn't blow happen, the zone if they lose, yeah, if that yeah. doesn't happen, you can't still run the play. You have to see that that's not happening now and make a decision. And this is the hockey IQ conversation that everybody tries to have is being able to make decisions about it. So when we lay this out and we start talking about this, like you said, you're going to talk about the one, two, two example, which is great. And that's like your, basically your foundational neutral zone play um, on the defensive side. But it's important that everybody knows there's different ways to do things. It's just a framework. It's just something you're going to build up from, et cetera. Just like yeah, well, you, you want to have a, like, again, you want to have a philosophy and understand, okay, what's it all about. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if, can I show the board for a second? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So from a, from, it doesn't matter which side of the side of the ice you're on. Right. So let's just say like the puck is here. Let's say a D has a puck here. So in the defensive zone coming out and you're four checking. So if you have, and this is just this, the, the, the very basics of hockey, if you don't teach or you don't think, then what will happen is you have, let's say the forwards all going after a puck. That's what, that's, that's what little, little kids hockey looks like. Yeah. Right. So if it doesn't change over time, then that's how you play hockey. Then this very simply, all you have to do is get the puck past three people. And now you have an odd, yeah, one odd pass, man rush. Yeah. One pass. Right. Eight, no, yeah. So pretty simple. So that's like the, as simple as you can say. Now, if you don't have the thing, so that might be very simple, but the truth is, is that a lot of people don't, teach a neutral zone so that's why it's important because it's like without any thought if you you could be playing a game kids could be playing a game and they could be going man like we can never get the puck when they have the puck or maybe you get lucky and you get it all the time because you got three really fast guys and they're all over the puck and you get breakaways like but there's no rhyme or reason why that happened right so in the neutral zone what you're trying to do is just as just a philosophy um like from a defensive standpoint is you're trying to stay what you've a lot of people have heard the term and maybe don't understand what when a coach says that, that you want to stay above the puck. So what that means or above their players, right? So that, what that means is that you're not chasing. So that means if, if, if a, if a D here has a puck and or a forward, whatever, they start skating and you're like on this side of them or on the outside of them and you're kind of behind and they're moving pucks ahead. That means you're, you're below the puck being above the puck it makes makes just simply means they're getting out of the way. So like in the offensive zone, if you're four checking, it goes D to D and you're, and you're always four checking like from behind, then you're chasing the game. But if you're, if you're, you know, if, if it comes across and the winger or the sentiment slides across, now you're above the puck and you're getting guys off to the outside. And that's really essentially what you're trying to do in the neutral zone is to negate anything coming through the neutral zone. Yeah. Right. So, so I want to talk about, I, I use this in, as an example in one of the videos I did. Um, and people also, people have been asking, cause I've been doing a lot of these on my TikTok. If you guys haven't seen those and you want to, I'm going to start to try to post them on some other platforms too. But if you go to my TikTok, you'll see where I do a lot of these just on the board. So one thing I was talking about in the context of offensive zone positioning, I have kids or coaches, whoever they are asking about how do I play center in the offensive zone or how do I play wing in the offensive zone? And I'm trying to teach the concept of you don't really have the same positions in the offensive zone as the defensive zone. So the way that I did it is I kind of drew it on your defensive side of the red line. It's kind of center wing wing. As soon as you pass that red line and you're starting to get into the offensive zone, it's um, going one, two, three. now you're changing into just first guy, second guy, third guy, which is why we call it F1, F2, F3. So whoever the first guy is, now you're going to be initiating whatever the play is. Second guy has a job. Third guy has a job. It's not centerman has a job. Winger has a job. Winger has a job. And that's, the same thing when we're talking about a lot of neutral zone stuff. A lot of times it's going to be 
the first guy does this, the second guy does this, the third guy does this. It's not the right winger does this, the left winger does this, the centerman does this. Frequently, it'll just happen to be just like in our D zone that the first guy back is a defenseman and the neutral zone it, it'll be a centerman is in the middle of the ice often just because that's where the centerman normally is so it could work out frequently that you have a right winger a left winger and a centerman in the same positions but generally speaking offensive zone or the offensive side of the neutral zone it's going to be like a first man second man third man type of thing so that's kind of your number one where i can see uh guys that ask me questions about it getting confused uh, if, if I'm a winger, I'm allowed to just go to the other side of the ice or if I'm a centerman, I'm allowed to stay on the wall or whatever. And the answer is yes, obviously, depending on what your coach says. But in general, it's not like you're glued to that position anymore. Does yep. that kind of make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. OK, so let's go um, by role or by uh, offensive defensive flow. So let's say if we're going to take offensive neutral zone first. So if we have the puck and we're coming out of our defensive zone, going through the neutral zone, talk a little bit about philosophy on what we're trying to do on our way through the neutral zone, attacking the other end. Okay, so I was going to do a, a neutral zone philosophy is when you're coming through on a, offensively, what you would like to do, your objective would be to gain the middle of the ice. The re, at least the dots in. So you want to, if you're skating, you want to get that puck moved. If you can, if there's an option, to at least inside this dot. If you're defending, your goal is to keep this guy outside the dot. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. So if you, so from an of, offensive, so th the reason is if you get to the middle of the ice, you have more options, right? Moving the puck laterally deep whatever and if you're defending you take away options because it's harder to make plays if you put them outside the house yeah right so sorry this goes if you guys didn't watch the d episode this is exactly what we talked about on the flip side with the d we always say the dot lines are your guides you're trying to keep guys outside the dots because if they're along the wall they only have one choice now they can only come to them towards you that's their only option and the flip side on the offensive side so that's a great way you can think about it because you've mentioned this before too how you're trying to think of what is the other team trying to do. So on the defensive side, if you guys know this from what we've taught in the last episode or even episodes before, it's the D are always trying to push you outside the dots. So as the offensive team, yeah. we're trying to get in the dots. Yeah, an offensive right? guy wants to go here. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's offense wants here, D wants you to go here, right? So yeah, so from the neutral zone, it's, it's just really number rule number one is if you're coming out as a winger or as a centerman, th this area here, that five-foot line roughly, uh, like width wise, I mean, is you don't want to play around with the puck too much. You either want to move it, skate it, or 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 chip it out to to a safe area. If this is the neutral zone where turnovers start, if you if you if you give up a puck in this area, then that could be in the back of your net quick. So that's like rule number one. So this might be like an obvious question, but if why is that why is that the area that everyone is so like caught up about? Why that five foot area, both blue lines? Why is that always said, like, we don't want to turn pucks over here? Why is this the bad the bad spot? I know it's turnovers, but I could turn the puck over at the red line. Why yeah. is it Why is it worse to turn it over at well, just your blue line? Or... Just because you are you turn over here and you, you're defending again. Yeah, so it's kind of like... Or, yeah. or if you don't turn it, or if you're, if you're offensive and you turn it over, now you're back checking. So it's like about gaining a zone. Yeah, because well, so, the way I think about it is guys, we're, we're, guys are starting to hit the gas this way. And if there's a there's a quick move back the other way now, now guys are caught because they thought we were going this way and now we're not. Whereas in the red line, guys are still kind of thinking both ways. But blue line, blue line, that's where you're going to catch guys. Maybe a D was trying to jump up and now there's a quick turnover and now we're, we're stuck or something like that. So that's why it's always harped on those blue lines as not being turnover areas. Yeah, 100%. So that's number one. You want to get it out of your zone. Out is good. Um, the next thing is you want to get it, like if you have a choice... Once you get it through the neutral zone, if you could come with speed, that's better. And if you can get the puck, enter the puck inside the the dots, even better because that gives you options for passing, shooting, or whatever. If you don't have an option to carry it in, right, you still want to get the puck, to, if you can, to the middle of the ice. And then you do like a just a kick out so that you have traffic going in there. Right. So that's like 
really that's the thing. And like for me, um, I don't care how it gets out. Like for like, there's no necessarily, um, there's not like you need to carry it or pass it or whatever. So whatever options there is your best option. And then there's the other ones would be uh, if you don't have a play, if you're a puck possession team, you might bring it back to your D and do neutral zone regroups or if there's a turnover regroups. But if you don't have a play, at, especially at a little bit higher levels, then it's a place to get the D to have to turn around and go chase a puck. So if they're going backwards and you get a puck behind them, then speed from the neutral zone could and should be the defenseman of pucks, which allows pressure. So that's the importance of gaining the neutral zone, owning the neutral neutral zone in the offensive, in the offensive fa- fashion is is important. Okay, so if I'm I'm that's kind of like the puck carrier. So puck carrier coming in, you're trying to get towards the middle of the ice. You have options either way. So if I'm assuming that's a forward carrying the puck, if I'm the other guys without the puck, what is the mindset? with the two guys not carrying the puck coming through the neutral zone. So it, now this will always depend on your coach and what they want to do. But if, if, um, if like basically you want to get to the middle of the ice, but if you want to support the puck and give, so let's just say it's coming straight up the middle of the ice and this is the center, keep it simple. Your job is. So, so sorry, center guy has the puck. Center guy, your yeah. centerman has the puck. So let's say he's more cheating on this side. Well, we could, we could have support. Like, so he's forcing a pass, like to create a two on one, right? If you can create two on ones, that's the most, that's where you can make plays. So if you, let's say this is a three on two with a winger and a winger. So what you want to do is kind of overload someone to make a two on one somehow. If you create two on ones, your odds are better, right? So that could be a pass and a pass back. It could be skating it and faking a pass, whatever. Um, But this guy might want to support a puck. So you're just looking at your options and saying, um, how do I get, give this guy an option. So that that could be like if you're deep in the or just coming out of the neutral zone, could be the puck coming here as a winger or even here somewhere in the way as a winger and a centerman coming up, he's probably supporting, but it could also be like a winger slashing across so you have like numbers, right? Three against two now. Right? So those are just things that you could be looking at as as uh as options. So it's like it's it's all about like in situations like all over the ice, what you're trying to do is outnumber people, right? So if you come through the neutral zone, like you'll see a lot of the times, um, this is something I teach in um, when we do two-on-ones because two-on-ones and two-on-twos drive me nuts in, in practice. So this is just a number thing. It has nothing to do with the neutral zone. Um, if you do a two-on-two, so you got a D and a D and you come up the ice and you got a forward and a forward. So many times you just see guys go one-on-one. And that's, they never work. So what you're trying to do on these is like, if this guy's a puck carrier, you're trying to maybe get out wide or cut to the middle and have a cut. So this becomes a two on one, right? So that's what you're trying to do in, in basically every situation. And then on two on ones, just to give people other things in practices, I, the one thing I have to harp on on practices is on a two on one, a lot of times you'll see in practice that they're, they're almost useless because guys will come in with speed and then they slow down and he slows down and defense doesn't have to work and they're looking at making plays and everybody stops. And uh, so they make their plays too too late usually. But what I tell guys on two on ones, especially in practice, I say, if you have the puck, treat it like you're on a breakaway. So bust your ass to the net to make this guy do something. And if he comes, then you've got that option somehow. And if he stays in the middle, then you, you're not sitting there going, okay, what should I do? Right. You can create your own offense from that. Yeah. Beautiful. And that does come from the neutral zone, by the way. Absolutely. That's I, you said exactly what I wanted you to say. That's great. Oh, really? I, that's a, my brain oh, was really? in the same spot. I was thinking like outnumber people support, find ways to isolate guys. Um, and then real, just real quick, cause I don't want to leave the defenseman out. What's if, if our forwards are chugging up and they're doing that thing, they're trying to isolate guys. What, what is my mindset as a defenseman when now I feel like I'm not in the play, like I'm done. I did my job. I moved it up. The forwards are going. So now what am I D thinking through the neutral zone? Okay. So that's a good question. And it's going to be t- depend on your coaching. And then it's about reading the game, right? So if, if you're looking at, uh, Let's okay. Let's say you make an outlet pass here to your center or winger, and you're the D now, and you're like you've got speed, right? And your your center's down here or your winger's down here, and you see that you can create with your speed a two on one or a three on two by you getting up there. By all means, do it because what you have to remember is like it's okay to have numbers, and and um, it's okay to have numbers, and just you got to know when enough's enough. But like it's especially in today's hockey, you see like 
a defenseman's not a defenseman. Usually it's a fourth forward, right? So it's okay for them to jump up in the plays to create offense. And if you're thinking hockey, if you if, if the if the uh, winger or centerman is the is the last guy out of the zone or the second last guy out of the zone, doesn't mean that he has to play center down here. If he's looking like there's you're seeing more numbers back checking, then it wouldn't make sense to necessarily jump in the play. Or you got a high guy or something like that. It, it doesn't make sense to jump in the play. It might mean that you have to slow down and take that last guy or you become the defenseman until there's a switch. So it doesn't really matter. So a defenseman jumping in the play is encouraged. It just has to be at the right time. So you don't just go there just to go. Um, you have to have a defensive responsibility when you come out. But certainly if you have speed, get up in the play with guys. So it, would you say as a rule of thumb, because I kind of think that this is a good rule of thumb, but maybe you disagree. For both D, if you're not joining the rush, still – like get to the blue line, like get up ice to the blue line. Don't just kind of lollygag it where there's a big gap between where the puck is and where you are. Like, I still feel like you should be, tr- obviously you're watching to make sure that you can transition on a turnover and be back. I'm not saying like be stupid about it, but I find so many times where if we have a three on two or, we, or even if it's a three on three that there other teams back checkers, a lot of them don't back check hard. So you have a chance to, get to the blue line even if you're not necessarily joining the rush as a late guy where you maybe you have some space rebounds get kicked out pucks go up the wall and you're already in a good spot to keep it in or stay on offense or whatever so i find it's just like a, a kind of a bad habit to you know move the puck and then just relax yeah no 100 percent. when you when you move a puck like just for example i was talking to guys this morning this is more of a uh, defense neutral zone doesn't matter so let's say i'm going left-handed here unreal so I, I have a rule that is applicable most of the time, and it, and it goes like this. He goes, it says, uh, if you don't move your feet, bad things will happen. If you move your feet, good things will happen, right? So, like, it's just like if we do a D to D pass right here. So, if we're, especially the wider we are, it doesn't really matter, but let's just say we're got some pretty big gap on the ice. If I, if I make this pass without moving my feet and I send that puck across to this guy, uh, it, it might be a good pass. Okay, great. Now. What happens next? If your feet aren't moving, you're stuck here. So if this guy comes up the ice and he doesn't have doesn't have an option to make a play and he needs your support, he can't make that pass back to you. So by moving your feet, it's just a natural thing that will happen. If you move your feet on this pass, and you, it, what happens is you'll end up somewhere in the middle of the ice. Okay? That's a really bad picture of whatever that is. So you're going to end up in the middle of the ice. So if this guy comes up the ice, and he doesn't need you, fine. If he if he comes up the ice and he's got pressure coming out like this, he can put it back to you, and now you're in the middle of the ice to make good options or to skate it up. The other thing would be is if you get in the middle of the ice, if you make that pass and you make that pass and you don't move your feet, if something goes wrong, the puck, guy gets a stick on it or it hits a rut or you bobble the puck and it ends up here, you're flat-footed, you can't move, he can't move, or he's moving this way. Now you've exposed the middle of the ice so you cannot defend. So by just a simple thing, by moving your feet, right, D to D, and you get your feet moving, anything bad that happens in that area where it's very dangerous, you're 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 taking care of it, right? So like... That's so when you're coming in the neutral zone and you see something coming, your guy's coming up the ice. Yes, D to D, move your feet, move your feet until you shouldn't move your feet anymore. So you wouldn't move your feet if there's the opposition's forwards were here and they have possession or something like that. So you, I, I don't mind one guy going and being a threat, especially if you have possession. And then one guy has to read numbers in front of them. And if there's one or two numbers that could be a threat, then you move your feet, but you're mobile. So right. that if there's a turnover, you get your ass to the middle. Yeah, you're already out. moving, right? right? Yeah, beautiful. So, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Powertech Online Membership Program. If you've been listening to Andy and I wondering, hey, how are they able to get all this podcast content out there? Well, that's because of our members. For just $9.99 a month, you can get access to our online video library, including hundreds of videos of Coach Andy teaching and have the option for consultation calls with Andy or myself to go over anything you need. We can cover training, nutrition, coaching, parenting, agents, the junior college hockey path, whatever's of interest to you. You'll also be able to participate in our popular Ask Me Anything episodes, have access to special discount codes, and be given priority for any Powertech in-person camps or events. 
If you like what we're doing here and you want to support us, this is the best way to do it. Visit powertechhockey.ca slash memberships or find the link in the description of this video to learn more. So I want to go to uh, some regroups now. So kind of along, actually, I was going to ask you to start at the, on the same point with those defensemen um, making that pass, moving their feet, their hinge thing. So maybe if you want to start with the D. So now if we're doing uh, neutral zone regroup, so we're still going to be on the offensive side. We're, we're regrouping, transitioning to go offense. Maybe start D has the puck. Uh, what are we looking for? And then you can do it however you want. If you want to go add the forwards into that as well, whatever's easiest for explaining purposes. What are we trying to do? How do we fill lanes? What's the mindset for each position kind of thing? Yep, no problem. So let's just do an old school regroup where it's going D to D. Like, And again, this is like, I'm going to do the basic thing. And I want whoever's listening to maybe think outside the box for what's good for them. Okay? Um, because I know like I watch teams that no matter what, no matter what, no matter what, and this is the philosophy and this is how they play, a D can get a puck caught here and it's strong side up. Strong side meaning where all the players are. It's like if you look at that, like if you look at that strategically, you're sit, you'd sit there and say, well, why don't move it to where the puck players aren't? But the, the habit is go strong side, go strong side, go strong side because the numbers are going to be there and you just keep checking, chipping it out. Some some guys go, it'll be a neutral zone group regroup, meaning either D to D, because there's no red line anymore with a guy this is usually older hockey with a guy up here to chip it in or to skate it in but their d are stretched out here too so it's like there's usually a chip in or it's a d to d to that but that's that's older hockey so what you're what you're actually trying to do in the in the neutral zone is traditionally is let's say it's a, a the the next most important person in my opinion, on a neutral zone regroup would be your sentiment. Or if you're back checking, the first guy back would be the, what we call, again, like what Eric said earlier, once the puck is dropped, there's really honestly no real such thing as a f winger, center winger. It's basically who's first. So the first guy back would be the most important person. It'd be like in your D zone. The guy, first guy back is like the sentiment that helps the D. So the centerman will dictate, um, needs patience and will dictate. So if we know we're going D to D or whatever, the centerman's got to kind of not be in a hurry. He's got to be able to have patience and come down low. So if this guy's got the puck and chooses to go up the, the strong side wall, then the centerman can't get too far ahead and curl already. He's got to be on the side to puck support. So that's why when you're coming back, you got almost have to slow down and see what the read is. So... If he starts moving this way and you know he's you know he's going to the wall, then you have to kind of support so that there's an easy pass there there or when the puck comes off the wall, you've got support for a quick for a quick pass. If he goes D to D, right? This is where a lot of guys get caught where the centermen are really important. A lot of centermen will just curl and get too far ahead of the game, and they I call it ass heels and elbows. If a D can see your ass, your heels, and your elbows, then you, you're not in a good position to take a pass. So you want to give yourself the opportunity as a center to get to get deep and to get low and to take a position. So if I'm a left-handed shot, my stick would be on this side on my forehand. So as I curl here, I, I can go eyeball to eyeball with him and he can make me a direct pass. And the only time it's not direct is when I get by him and it's only for a split second. So you want to give that option. Then, So the centerman is the most important. It takes patience to read the play and then on a neutral zone regroup some guys go if the center goes to the wall this guy swings it depends on what you want the, then the opposite would be true that if the center goes here the winger stays here so it's like touch passes and it's it's actually just a preference on what you like you know and then your and your personnel and then the far side like if it goes d to d then you you know cut slash cut between the d or create that option or and then it depends if you're throwing in dumps and you have systems in place for that maybe he comes this way because you know it's going to be a hard rim yeah and but, then and but the basics is that that's that 
that stuff is up to the coach and the team systems. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Is same thing to your point. Even that weak side winger, like sometimes your coach will glue him to the blue line yeah. at the far side. Yeah. Sometimes they'll glue him at the near side. Like in college, we had our coach keep our, the winger low at our blue line yeah. to get that cross seam pass, yeah. whatever. So yeah. there's a whole bunch of different things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you take – so your point is like D – D, so that when it comes down and you know it's going D to D, you want this guy either being here or here or here. Mm -hmm. or, like, depends on what you want out of Yeah, right. If sure. you want to stretch it out and have nothing pretty, just chip it in, then you're going to get your guy high. Yeah. And this is where, like, at higher level hockey, this is where we can start to think about um, the philosophy of why we're doing this. A lot of times, if you get a good team, a team that's real good in the neutral zone, like we just said, where they can really force you to get trapped on one side or trap you at the red line, this is where teams will start to look for ways to get pucks to the other side of the ice where there's right. space and expose things. And this is where the strategy of the game starts to come in at higher levels, right? Like that low winger example, that opens up a ton of space. Typically, if you can make that pass, so you're trying yeah. to get a seam to get it away from the clogged upside. Yeah. So that's where the strategy comes in. Yeah, and how about, how about having something happening down here, but you send a forward like a forward right in the middle. Now it's that. And now you got some speed coming where you can knock it around. So that's where the strategy in the neutral zone is huge. That can make a huge difference in the outcome yeah. of games. Now, maybe just like taking a step back in the neutral zone, when we're doing a regroup, one thing that I think might be useful for coaches and for players, but for coaches too, trying to teach it is the regroup in the neutral zone is, is just another breakout. Basically. Yeah. It's like you're, you're doing a breakout at the blue line now, instead of behind your net. Right. So that's an, a good way of thinking about it because you can run the same play. Like you can literally run a breakout just above by the blue line. Now, the nice thing about the neutral zone is a lot of times you're not going to get the other team going ape shit four check on you. So you actually have some more time if you have D that can, you know, pull the puck back, make a play and be patient with it, all that. So a couple points um, that kind of differ from the breakout is a lot of times when you're doing a breakout in your own end, you're, there's a bit of urgency because you have guys that are coming after you right away. You'll have an F1, F2 coming low on you. They want to finish hits on the wall and get down on you. So there's some more urgency to make plays where the neutral zone, a lot of times you can be more patient because they might send one guy to push. They're not going to send two or three typically. Yeah. Or so, they send three and because they don't know what they're doing. Like, right. They're not thinking it. And you can just put it by three guys. Exactly. So, so for your, with your team or for players that are having a hard time grasping neutral zone stuff, just to keep it super simple, just say, we're going to, it's just our breakout, but instead of being behind our goal line, now it's behind our blue line. We're just moving it up a bit and you can run the same options just as a way to keep it simple. But a big issue that I've, I've have found, um, and this goes for, if we got into special teams, like power play breakouts too, is guys rushing the play. So as defensemen, a lot of times you're quarterbacking these passes. And if you try to do things too quick before your forwards are in their lanes, then we're not set up in the options that we want. Or if you wait too long with the puck, now the options are gone. So it's important that we're, we're staying coordinated in the same way we would a breakout. You know, we're, we take the option to the winger when we have it. We take the center option when we have it. Everybody should be coordinated working together. So that's a good way, I think, of framing that. It's just yep. a breakout. You're just moving 100%. it up a little bit, you right? just move the ice up. Yeah. So um, maybe switching. Is there anything else on the offensive side first before we go to defensive things? Yeah. So in the neutral zone as a hockey player, this is where you you learn to think. Like you can you either, as you're coming through the neutral zone and you're a very skilled guy, like a lot of times the skilled guys get themselves a lot of trouble because they try to do too much, right? So the, remember, just remember in the neutral zone and depends on what type of mindset you have. If you're here, if you're a coach or a player that doesn't care about the game within the game or the, the systems, and I'm not saying that in a negative way, if you're saying I just want development and that means this kid could skate through five guys if he wants, then you're going to, you can expect a ton of turnovers, right? Right. And you might have the best skilled guy in the world. You're still going to get turnovers. Um, so just understanding if you, if you're playing for, if you're playing and you want to be like a little bit system or like you want to win games, um, then when you're not sure what to do, once you get over the red line, then, you know, maybe the goal is not to, piss around with it at the blue line is to put it in a spot where you can get it on a four check from the neutral zone. So in behind the D and then other than that, you know, like a, a good play, you know, drills you can do for uh, when you're entering the blue lines is like entry drills. So 
you can have coaches or pressure at the blue line where when you're coming in, it's hard to skate it in and learning how to make passes underneath sticks or through the triangles with some speed and vice versa outside to inside. Um, you can do stuff like that, but that's basically where you're going to gain zones or, or lose zones. So I'm done with the offensive side of that. Yeah. yeah. No, no, that's good. It's good stuff. Cause uh, last thing too, I was just going to say with, uh, cause I didn't even think of this till right now is another thing about uh, dumping the puck. A lot of coaches like the dump and chase thing. That's very common youth hockey. Um, one, one way to make that a little bit more high level, cause I'm not saying it's wrong necessarily cause there's a time to do everything. But uh, one thing you can start to do too with, if you are going to dump the puck in is start to have your players think about dumping it in with a purpose. So not just throwing it in because you said dump it in, but throwing it in to where a guy's going. Where speed's yeah. going, where you're going to get possessed. Throwing it on the goalie. Two like, guys on a puck. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. if you want to start making that a little more high level on the offensive side of the neutral zone, that's what you could do is start start trying to, if you want to play dump and chase, that's cool, but try to do it with some purpose to it instead of just throw it in because coach said, you know, so uh, okay, let's go defensive side now. So you said you wanted to go from like a one two two to start. Well, yeah, which I, I like that because it's like it just shows like it it, it keeps things simple. You can super build from foundation. There. Yeah. yeah for so sure. again, as a as a when the other team has possession, so let's say full possession. I'm talking or f- like close to full possession. This D has the puck, and I see he, he grabbed a puck, and his partner's here, another D, and we if we like. Just to keep it real simple, if we send one, two, or three guys, that means there's only two guy two guys here. They have three. Like we're outnumbered if there's a, a turnover. Now some people would like and, and and trust me, there's teams that have four checkers like this and they don't care about the D to D or they have a guy here, they might put two guys on it. Like there's all different kinds. But for me, if you want to understand the the neutral zone really quickly, I think it's something that you could teach younger people very very easily. You don't have to be super aggressive. You just have to uh, actually have more patience than anything. So what this would be is like, and again, reading the neutral zone is if you if you don't have possession, you have to think defensively. If you have possession, then you think offensively, right? So let's just say this defenseman has the puck, and you're the first guy coming in. Like let's say you're even on the on a shit angle. Right, so it's not center, it's not winger, it's not D. It's who the first guy is to put pressure on. So this guy has full pressure or almost full possession. I mean, so if we chase this guy, if this if that guy comes at him in a straight line like this, sometimes it'll work, but usually it won't because this guy can make one step this way to beat you, one step this way to beat you, or just move the puck. And if he moves the puck in any direction. You're going here, so you you miss that guy totally. So it's about angles, and it's about dictating the play. So if you're if you're the first guy in the neutral zone when they have possession, it's about cutting off the lane. So what is our? Here's the philosophy. Where do you want them to have the puck? The the offense, right? We, uh, so if I have the puck, and if I'm if this guy has the puck, and I'm skating from here, outside in, then I'm pushing. He's taking the puck exactly where they want to go and then exactly where I don't want them to go. And that's gaining inside the dots. I don't want that puck to end up here. What I want, so that's the first thing, is where do we want to take the puck? We want to take the puck. If it's wide, we want to keep it wider. If it goes D to D, we want to keep pushing them to the bleachers, right? So this guy's got the puck. I, I'm trying, I, I, my drawing is just horrible. Okay. So what I want to do is instead of going at him, I want to take an angle to the middle. Now that might seem like, well, that's weird. But now if you take to the middle and you put your stick in the middle now, he can't really make that play. If he does, he's taking a a, a huge risk. And I would say he's not the brightest guy, (laughs) right? (laughs) So you take away this option. So now he's like, okay, I can't really move the puck in this area. So I have to go this way. So that's, which we call the one in the one, two, two. So this guy kind of just gets underneath him, not on top of him. You kind of get underneath him. So like if we do a checking drill, so I'm just going to change um, gears here. So if a guy comes out of his zone like this, if we attack like this, it's one step to, to beat you. If he comes around the net like this and we get almost underneath him and we force that angle to the wall, that's what we're trying to do to take away his options. That's what we're trying to do to this D is to take away that option. 
Okay, so now you get underneath him a little bit and you force him. You might even be behind him a little bit, but that's okay. So he starts going up here, you're going here. So what you've done is you've taken away half of his ice. Okay, so that's good. Now he feels pressure. Now, now, what's the next part of the forecheck? And it doesn't have to be this, but this is just an option. The next part would be to make sure that he stays on the outside of the ice. So the 2-2 two -two part goes, your other forward would be in this area, inside the dots, inside the dots. You have your D inside the dots, inside the dots. So now there's your other four guys. Okay? Now, that's simple enough. Like the philosophy, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail after. So the philosophy now would be, as he's coming up the ice, this guy is almost in a straighter line, but he just works real hard to take away that ice now. So now you're shrinking this guy's ice to make plays even more. Mm -hmm. Right? So he's got F1 pressuring his back pocket. Right. So now you got the back pocket. And, and F2 you got cutting his, cutting cutting his head him off. off there. Yeah. So he's, now he's thinking, as you get older, is it a hit? Is it a stick on puck? Is it both? Right? Oh, I don't, I'm running out of time. I'm going into these boards. What do I have to do? So what we're trying to do is by the time he gets to the red line, is run them out of real estate or not take away any or take away any other plays, right? So let's say it doesn't work the first time. So we got one, so one, two, two, D, D. That's your four or five. Okay, so if it, let's say you're going here and he makes a D to D, that's fine because now. You've, you've taken angles. All you're doing is you're just switching your angles and you're still underneath this guy. You, these guys are still taking away the middle of the ice, but let's just say this guy does get to make an option. So now the, the next phase of this would be these guys are looking at, they're not just there doing nothing. What you want to do is you want to be on top of the other players. So you want to take away the red line or the top of the other players. So if they've got guys up like right at the red line, then that's your challenge is you want to plug that up. So you want to get more higher, right? So that, but the, the point of this is that you position yourself. So let's just say, um, let me, uh, give me a different color. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so we're playing the green guys. So let's say the, the centerman is here and the winger is here and the winger is here. Okay. So we're not worried about, um, so if it goes D to D here, that's fine. We're underneath. If he makes that center play, this guy steps up. If he if he goes to the winger, this guy pushes, this guy pushes, and this guy pushes and squeezes. This guy comes to the middle. This guy comes to the middle. There's there's no room to make a play. So this is where turnovers happen, right? But let's just say they're a really smart team, and they they can defend this a little bit, at least a little bit. Because nothing's ever perfect, but you, this is just about reading the game now. It's, right? You're staying on top of these guys. Now, if you have these guys too low and they make that pass, now we've got, it could be a 2 on 0 or 3 on 0 That's why these guys have to just, that's what I mean on being on top of them. Does that yep. make sense? Yeah, above them. Yeah. Okay. Now, if the puck goes to a D to D, let's say they, they were smart and we we're going for that four check and they went, they went D and this guy starts carrying and they were smart. Like we talk, talked about earlier, when this guy moved the puck, he came back to the middle of the ice for a hinge and this guy starts going and this guy starts sealing it off, but then he sends it back. I'm real deep in the zone here. Sends it back to this guy. Cause he wants to, cause they reading, Oh, we're going to hinge it and going to send it to this guy so he can take off. Well, this is why the middle of the ice, you're still taking the middle of the ice, but this guy, this is his guy. So now it goes there, comes up the ice. This guy goes like this, and you've got your one-on-one. -on -one, and these guys just simply shift. Right. So it keeps it fairly simple. I hope that's simple. Yeah. So, okay. So let's do oh, this. simple then. for me and you, maybe? No, no. I but don't know if it's the, for the flow makes sense, but may, let's okay. take a step back. So let's just clear this off here. So I want you to use, let's use green and draw their team in a, in a neutral zone regroup. So they're this, regrouping. yeah, they're regrouping. So just do general positions. So we got a D, a D, a centerman, a winger, and a winger. Okay. So... Puck's not moving. Let's just say, like, defenseman has the puck here. And where are the black guys? Just in coverage, basically. Let's just say where's coverage. So our, we know our F1, we want him to cut the middle. So he's going to be somewhere to initiate the first push. Right. Now, where are my other guys? Yeah. Where are my other guys to, to begin in the neutral zone? Okay. Just so, basic coverage, just so yeah. we can see where our guys are. This would be, he's cutting them off, so we know F2 should be F2. Yep. And who's his so primary? the dots. Yeah. 
Okay. It's not outside the dots. It's inside the dots somewhere in here. And you're taking away kind of this pass. Right. So you're or this skate. So your primary thing is your dot lane. You're staying on the defensive side or yes. above their winger. Yes. And your primary goal is either going to be to, to be the second guy pushing that D, like yes. you just said, if he comes your way, or you're taking that winger if a pass is made to that yes. guy. Okay. So yep. there's so that's you. That and that. Okay. So now so other F4. three is here. Yeah. So it's not the dot. What are we trying to protect on those on the neutral zone in our defensive zone? The middle of the ice. So if I'm over here. I open up this lane. So you're just clogging up the middle of the ice. So this guy has, it's hard to, for him to make an option. All he sees, it's his guy, but he sees a black guy there too. He sees this guy, but he sees a black guy there too. He sees a defenseman. Or, sorry, that's inside the inside the dots here. So it's like, there's a lot of guys there. He sees a defenseman in the middle of the ice here. So when this guy's looking coming up the ice, he doesn't see a whole lot of options. He sees pressure. Right. So this is our basic coverage now. So we have yeah. F1, F2, F3. Well, the reason we call this a 1-2-2 two, two is because we have one guy first. Next two guys are in a line. Next two guys are in a line. So that's 1-2-2. Two, two. That's yeah. why we call it that. So everybody's in coverage. So now from this, we can see the example you gave at the end there where how we're kind of overloading towards the right-hand side of the ice for yeah. the green team. Yeah. So if they're smart and they do that hinge, we, yeah, okay. we can the see hinge. that we can see that open space now on the yeah. far side, right? So, so now if we do the, the hinge, hinge... comes back to this D? Yep. Okay. And they go up the other side. Yeah. So now it's as simple as this. This is honestly as simple as it is. Goes, he, he, brings it, he brings it back to this D. So this D is obviously coming up this wall. It's as simple as turn it, take away the middle. And it's, it's actually this simple. Stay on top of these guys and go like this 10 feet. Nothing else. There's nothing else to think about except stay on top of those other guys. That's it. And then if it comes up the wall, pressure. Pressure, pressure. Yep, for sure. To the middle. That's beautiful. That's so now, all it is, man. And that's like your like super one on one, like easy, perfect. So our F one does the reattack if they do that hinge, whatever. If they some some coaches, and this is where the creativity part of it or the strategic part comes in again, because maybe their D made a really nice pass across ice to their winger. It gets there quick. That's where sometimes teams will have that weak side defenseman jump way up or something, and you have to make adjustments that way. But as a general rule, like we said, just foundation, this is as basic as, as it gets uh, for on the defensive side of the neutral zone. And this is where, at the start of the episode, we kind of talked about the philosophy in the D zone. This is where you can make teams really frustrated because what I, what I like to do, at least when I think about neutral zone, is try to force their guys to have to make good plays, you know, because they have the puck. So they're going to be running plays they want to be running. They're going to have guys where they want. They have the advantage when they have the puck. So we have to, we have to react to what they're doing if we can put them in a position where their guys have to make good plays. So forcing guys to make backhand passes, forcing guys to make sauce passes, forcing guys to turn and, and hinge back and make other plays that they didn't want as a first option. That's where you can cause frustration, mistakes, turnovers, because especially at youth levels, guys aren't that good yet. So it's hard. You might get the odd really good player. Obviously there's exceptions where guys can make really good plays, but forcing guys to have to make good plays can oftentimes result in turnovers. Yep. You get pucks and you For can sure. go back the other way, right? Yeah. So, so the other thing with this is like, this is why I chose this this neutral zone four check because and I'll, I'll give a couple of reasons. For the F1, for the first guy in, it teaches them a little bit about cutting off the ice. So for example, I'm just going to draw it down here. If we go, if you do, and it's fine. I'm not telling anybody actually what to do. I'm just saying this is why I would I like doing this for kids, for, for youth. If we go with the opposite and go, let's say it's just like a defensive zone coverage, winger take them, winger take them, center take, stay with your center. There's like, it's I, I find it less teachable. You're like you're learning to just put pressure on people, but there's it's it's a little bit less teachable. There's not as much structure to not it. Not as much structure sure. to it. Like, and that's maybe good or bad, but there's you're 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 it's more individually you're more individually responsible. And I find with the, with a one, two, two, like anyways, in this scenario, I find that you can teach everybody all at once. Do you see what I mean? So what you're teaching, you do, you can practice this with every person. You can have coach, coach, and just practice cutting off that ice. So throwing a puck there and having the, having the player come in and just cut off the ice and forcing up the wall. That's a really teachable thing. Well, why is that teachable? Because that's used all over the ice. When you learn, you saw me doing a drill this morning with 
guys doing cutbacks in the corners and I had defensive guys there not really doing much, but I was also teaching them like you're not allowed to let him have that inside lane. So it was teaching them that angle piece to force them in certain places. So I like that, that you teach them how to force. And then it's really coachable, right? So if something goes wrong, you can teach all five guys instead of just one, right? So like if the puck comes up here and this guy is kind of lost or he's up way too high or he's too wide, it's a real teachable moment. Like it's so obvious for them. And it's just like teaching them how to think a little bit, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Because the other, other ways... And you're that, teaching team. Right. Teaching team. I was, that was you're exactly the, like, If you're the weak link, it's like you're the problem. Yeah. Right? But it's coachable. Like there's nothing worse. Like I think you said this. You, were t- you took over a team that there wasn't really any coaching. So when a kid comes off the ice, if you don't have any structure in any little way, like I'm not talking like, um, I'm not talking John Tortorella structure. I'm just talking like we're going to play a certain way. If you don't have anything, then what te- what do you teach when they come off the ice? Like if you don't have a neutral zone or a, or a four check itself and an F3 or three guys, whatever it is, if you don't have that and they, and, and they can't get the puck into the zone or they can't, they can't execute a play when they come off the ice, you can't, what do you say? Work harder or that's what the words are, right? You guys got to work harder. You got, you guys are not working hard. You guys, you got, come on guys. That's not coaching. Those are words that you don't expressing that you don't know what you're doing. But if you give a little bit of structure like that, you can see something break down and you can say like, or, or you could say great job in the neutral zone guys, because they couldn't get it past the red line. That's exactly what we're trying to do. The reason is, Good cutoff. We shifted well. We pressed the right way. Or, or that was really good. Except when F three or F two or F three was, we had him come off the wall. You just didn't go hard enough. If you start learning how to get there hard, we'll have the puck all game. And that's what coaching is. Like if you give them a little bit of structure. I, I was going to say the same thing, okay. but the team thing because the otherwise it's basically just one on ones all over the ice, and now we're just playing shinny again which that's what it ends up being. And it can be really frustrating when you're trying to play as a team when there's zero structure to it. You know, we've made this point before about when you go to training camps, how nobody has any systems in place. There's no structure in place. So guys are just falling back to their basic knowledge um, on how to play. And it can be difficult to play that yeah, way. Some right? guys look horrible. Exactly. So now it's just, you're turning it into a 1v1. And this is why typically like D zone's a great example where it's not very often you get a five, five person man on man defense. Like it's mostly just here's your area, here's your area, here's your area. Switch where appropriate, so that we can actually talk and there's some team to it. Otherwise, it's just one on ones everywhere, and the best player will win. That's how one on ones work, right? So, um, so anyways, that's that's uh, that's D side. I think that that's awesome. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today a little bit was just neutral zone face offs. So we can do this this super quick. I just want to go on a win. You can do whichever dot you want. I just want to go off a win, off a loss. Um, what are we trying to do? What's the philosophy? What's the coverage? Just as a basic, because there's a million different face off yeah, plays I, you can do. I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's. Um, I don't think we need the board either. No, okay. no. I don't think in in, in face offs like in neutral zone face offs. I don't think it's important because there's like like you said, there's one thousand different ways to take a face off. The philo- my philosophy would be is you go into face offs unless it's designed not to be this, is to go in there the expectation what if we lose the face off every single time so as a centerman my job would be win or lose unless it's designed otherwise is i win or lose that draw and i stick to my guy get my stick between his legs and i don't let him go i stay on the defensive side until i feel we have possession and we can go okay for wingers I call it squeezing. I don't like the wingers to release from their man. So if you take that face off, right? Like here's two guys. If you take off too early and it's a defense and and you're and we lost the draw, then you're on the outside of the play. You're not defending, you're not blocking guys out. So I just call it squeezing. And until that puck is won or lost, then you go to your position. So that's that's basically so the it, philosophy. It'd be like you, you keep contact with your guy kind of thing. Yeah, you know, in case there's a, a puck three feet away from you, you don't yeah. want to be pulled away from it, right? Yeah. So unless otherwise, that's what I would say. But then there's all kinds of face-off draws, that, uh, face-off plays that you can make in the neutral zone that, that uh, could have you on the far side or releasing right away or defense taking your spot. So I don't, I don't know if I could go into a lot of detail any other ways than go into a face-off thinking D first. 
and uh, unless otherwise told because sometimes there's face-off plays where you lose them on purpose like so that you have pressure going to the points or whatever when they win so yeah. that's all i have to say about that okay, beautiful um that's all i had for today okay. i think that was great I, we were flowing that was good yeah anything else to say about neutral zone stuff i in general? i just think okay i i I mean, when you talk about something, it becomes the most important part of your life, right? It's like if we talk about health, if you read a book about eating and you discover that uh, avocados and broccoli are the mo- and, and eating meat is the most important thing and you buy into that, then that's where your mindset is all the time. Uh, so today, Nutrizone, like when you start thinking about it, you go, wow, this is like really, really important. I can be a really good hockey player in the Nutrizone, which is very true. Um so I would I would say the neutral zone your defensive zone if you and if you want to be a good pro or if you want to get to junior get your school paid for you want to be a really good hockey player um that's the area that where you would really like to uh, I would say study study and work really really hard at being a defensive player and a neutral zone defensive player because you'll be undercover uh undercover really good hockey player all of a sudden turnovers will happen simply because you're good at it oh last thing about oh i do have one more thing it'll take the uh take the yeah it's actually very important because we didn't talk about um back checking or tracking okay so it's it's really simple guys this is actually really important you make a difference I, i was watching a couple ohl games the other day and i was watching one person in particularly back check so the play would happen a winger, and he would come back. He would come back, fifty percent speed, and he was back checking like out here. Okay, so when you're back checking, so and even if you came back at a hundred percent, as hard as you can, if you're coming back through here, what part of the zone are we trying to take away from the other team? The middle. So. When you don't, like, and it always comes back. We talked about in a defensive zone. If you don't know what to do, go back to your, the house, home plate, whatever they call this stupid thing. Call it whatever you want. That looks like a muffin. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pear. With, a, with yeah, something yeah. on it. But w- your instinct should be to take away their threats. So if your habit is puck gets turned over, I've got a back check, it's not out here. You're not helping your team. You're actually helping them. So your instinct should be in this area here, in between the dots, you're busting your ass. Just be in there Just somewhere. Just be in there. Yeah. Be in there with speed because I can't tell you the good players that – here's the thing. You, I watch, you watch a kid get a puck. My son's one of them. It, was, it happened the other day. Gets a puck off the wall. He's got it right about here. He's got it. He's got a little bit of gap, and he was going – He's got the puck, so he's going to be just a tad slower. He was going, getting ready to make a play. Guess what? This kid on the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds, young guy too, had a little bit of speed, and it was like one, two, three, under the stick, stole it. So my kid stole it from one guy, got it. This guy stole it from him, got it. And then this guy, my my kid back checks hard back to the middle, and it disrupts that play, and it gets going. But that's what I'm talking about. So in the back check, you don't know what the guy, this puck carrier here, I don't know what that means, this puck carries, you don't know what he's thinking. You don't know if he's slowing down because he sees pressure. He's looking for a play. I can I can guarantee you if you bust your ass through the middle and knock that puck away or just get in the way that you change the game. If you do that on a regular basis, coming back to the middle, you are a game changer. And you know what? People don't do it. You can watch a game and it's very, very uh, few and far between where you see good trackers or back checkers that just they get on the horse and they come right back through the neutral zone up to here but this is important if you put pressure anywhere in here where they have to make plays to enter the zone you've made a guy's life really really hard yeah for sure you know so that's the, that's what i would end on and then that's lovely last thing for me is because i'm even just thinking of, of this now coaching the team um i'm having a hard time as a coach deciding what to work on because there's so many things that we should be working on. So just for this is, I'm going to end off just kind of more for coaches. If you're listening to these podcasts, you're looking at you're like, holy shit, like we don't do any of this stuff. Like we need to work on everything. We need complete overhaul. We need, it's okay. It's just pick, pick a thing, pick a theme that you're going to do for the week, for a couple weeks, whatever, and use drills to work on that thing. So just as an example of what I'm currently doing, 
I use our Tuesday practice. We have an hour and 20 minutes. I use that to focus on defensive zone. Uh, so that includes coverage. That includes getting pucks off the wall. That includes breakout options. That includes face-offs in the D zone, et cetera. My Tuesday practices, until further notice, are working on that. That includes battle drills in the corners, like urgency to battle in our end. So the theme for my Tuesday practices is defensive zone. And that's how I'm keeping it until I feel like we've improved. I would love to have an hour and a half to work on offensive zone. I'd love an hour and a half to work on only neutral zone. I would love that, but you're limited. You only have so many resources. My Thursday practice, I do special teams. We only have one hour. So I do power play penalty kill. And then we usually have a Friday practice. Sometimes we don't if we have games or whatever. I have an hour and a half where I'll take whatever happened in the previous two practices and work on what sucked. So there's so many more things I need to work on. I need to work on neutral zone. I need to work on offensive zone. I need to work on everything and I can't do it. So I'm prioritizing what I feel are the most important things. And for us right now, it's making sure tightening up our defensive zone and then working on our penalty kill of special teams for me personally. That's our team what, where I'm putting most of my stock today. After a few weeks, maybe that changes. And then I'll go to this neutral zone stuff where we really focus on four check coverage, et cetera, to try to make that better. And then we can cycle it back to D zone again in a few months if we need to or, or whatever. So my message to coaches is just don't let this feel like, wow, we have so many things to do. I don't know how we're going to work on all this stuff. It's like you don't have to work on everything. Yeah. Just pick a few things. Yeah, and if I think if it helps, like you'll hear this all the time, is like if you, you, you teach defense and you let offense take over. So I would, I would use that as a philosophy if I was saying, well, what, even if you got the best, fastest offensive team, well, especially if you do, those guys need to learn how to play good D. So good structured, like not totally structured, but give them something to do where it's re they're responsible in their D zone. And when they don't have the puck, that's like, so the, the last part of this is you hear people say like, um, your play without the puck needs to get better, like as a scouting thing. Well, what does he do without the puck? And that's a very good question because you only have the puck for a small period of time. It's what you do without the puck that makes all the difference in what type of hockey player you are, right? Connor McDavid has the puck a lot, but it's not nearly as much as he doesn't have the puck. So the reason he gets the puck a whole lot more, if you look at the progression of his career, I'm not a... I'm not trying to... Analytics guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you look at how his career went, his defensive coverage and his defensive give a shit meter went way way up because it's no slight against really good offensive players they're so good offensively that they they, they just wait for those things when they're young and the coaches aren't going to give them shit because those are the guys get three four five goals a game they win your tournaments so and they get their ass kissed a lot of the times um but good coaches will take those guys and like teach them to d decide so anyways connor connor mcdavid um for example has improved his defensive zone or defensive side of the puck so much that he gets the puck more in different areas. He helps his team out more. He's a way better player just simply by being on the D side and gets the puck more. But that's the question you have to ask. If I don't have the puck, what am I doing? So those are those kind of those, the neutral zone, the support and all that stuff, the back track, the tracking and all that stuff, stick in positions. Those are all things that you do without the puck. And the guys that do things well without the puck become very good hockey players. And especially as you get older, right? So that's that's why this is so important. So if I could, if I could, uh, you know, you might have coaches that just actually don't know what they're doing, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. That's that's youth hockey. That's reality, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I went to take a trumpet lesson today, I wouldn't expect. <laughs> what's the guy, Kenny G? Yeah, uh, Kenny G's not teaching. Timmy trumpet. Timmy trumpet. Yeah. <laughs> Timmy, trumpet. <laughs> Timmy trumpet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, he's not teaching. There's going to be someone that. Is, can play the trump a little bit. Maybe it's a high school student or something like that. It's like they don't know ins and outs. So, but you, that's why you personally, as a player, is try to find things like. And this is a good way when people listen to this. They maybe for the first time here. Oh, I have to be good in the neutral zone, or oh, I didn't know that piece. Maybe I'm going to work on that. If you take one thing out of this, you're actually going to see some progress. Like, and the one thing that I could say everyone can do. Everyone like uh is is the tracking is that when you lose possession it's going the other way if you just bust your ass through the through the dots in the middle and come back to your defensive zone your game is going to be exponentially better just doing that so that's that sick. play without the puck that's all i like that was sick i'm not trying to toot our own horn here <laughs> but that was a yeah. good episode oh good, oh, good. good. good, good. Okay. that's what we want it to be man so next week offensive zone and then that'll wrap up a little okay. mini series here okay cool. goodbye goodbye